We trust our senses to give us an accurate picture of the world around us, but sometimes our senses get it wrong. Imagine you're watching two teams on a basketball court warm up, and you're supposed to count how many times the team wearing black shirts passes the ball. They're moving really fast, but since you're super focused, you get an accurate count of 13 passes. But while you were counting, did you also notice the gorilla moonwalking across the court? If you didn't, you're not alone. What we take in with our senses and how our brains interpret that information doesn't always match up. And if we're going to try and make decisions using the most accurate information possible, we need to understand how our perception affects that process. Perception is the process of selecting, organizing, and interpreting information that helps us understand the messages and signals we're receiving. That's a lot of words to basically say, perception is how we attempt to make sense of our environment. And if you're perceptive, you can probably guess what we're talking about today. I'm Cassandra Ryder, and this is SETI Hall, Intro to Human Communication. As we communicate, we use our senses to take in information and understand what it means. But because there's so much going on in our world around us all the time, our brains can't process every single detail, which is how we somehow missed a dancing gorilla. A dancing gorilla! Fortunately, perception is also an iterative process, which means we do it over and over all the time. We select, organize, and interpret information about a situation, then start the whole process over again. So we can think of perception like it's working in a constant cycle that has three parts, selection, organization, and interpretation. Let's take a look at that perception cycle in action. Imagine you pull up to a red light and notice that the car next to you has a busted fender. That's the first part of perception known as selection, which occurs when we focus our attention on specific sensory information in our environment. Because the busted fender is an unusual piece of sensory information, your brain selects it as something to focus on. From there, you move on to organization, which is the part of perception where your brain sorts and categorizes sensory information based on existing cognitive patterns, which are basically templates we've made to help us reason and problem solve. Essentially, your brain is sorting information into bins based on your prior experiences. So your brain might see something like a snake and sort it into the dangerous bin rather than the safe bin, or select a flower and move it from pretty into the pretty but makes me sneeze bin. In this instance, maybe you've seen a car accident before before. So your cognitive patterns say that busted fenders are caused by car wrecks, so you categorize the damage as the result of a collision. Then you move to interpretation, which is the third and final part of perception. Here, you assign meaning to new experiences using information that our brains have stored from prior ones. So let's say that you've seen 10 fender benders and all of them were caused by reckless drivers. Over time, your brain has formed patterns that lead you to interpret busted fenders as a sign that the driver of this car is reckless too. And that's how the perception process leads you to make meaning from information you absorb in the world around you. But the perception process doesn't end there. It starts over again the second the driver revs up and runs the red light. Your brain selects the stimulus of the car speeding off then organizes that behavior into the category of reckless driving. Based on your existing cognitive patterns, your brain takes the dented bumper, adds in the reckless driving, and concludes that the driver is dangerous. But no matter how attentive we are, we still make errors in our perception, which are known as misperceptions. In the car scenario, we used sensory information and our cognitive patterns to interpret the busted fender and quick getaway as a sign of dangerous behavior. But that isn't the only plausible explanation. Let's put on our detective hats for a minute and think about different equally valid reasons someone might run a red light in a dinged up car. For instance, the car could have been in a hit and run. And if the hit and run happened recently, the driver could be frantically rushing to the hospital because someone's been injured. Or maybe the driver ran the red light because she's actually being chased by three war parties and a group of bandits she made a clandestine deal with. Okay, that last one is actually just Mad Max Fury Road. The point is that there are several possible explanations for the busted fender. So our perception about the driver's behavior could be wrong. Misperceptions come from differences in perceptual filters, which are the values, attitudes, personal preferences, and life experiences that we view information through. For instance, because different cultures have different practices and values, our cultural experiences can cause us to misinterpret other people's actions. Like, say you're a medical doctor who's never caused a car accident. Because you hold the misperception that members of your cultural group are too responsible to cause car wrecks, you assume that the driver with a busted fender is not a doctor. Even though you can't know that for sure, 
Our cognitive patterns can also make us vulnerable to stereotypes or generalized beliefs about a group of people that often result in misperceptions. So if we buy into the stereotype that drivers with dented bumpers are the most dangerous drivers on Earth, we might start treating every dinged up car like it's being driven by a crash test dummy. There's also the primacy effect, which leads us to place more value on the first information we receive about a person. Since we can't interact with the driver of that car, we draw conclusions based on the first information we receive about them. And in this case, it's based on their busted fender and their choice to run a red light. Based on that first impression, we form a potentially inaccurate opinion of the driver, which is the primacy effect in action. Then there's the recency effect, which leads us to place a higher value on the most recent information we have about a person. So if we see the damaged car speed into a hospital parking lot after running the red light, we might change our negative perception to account for this new information. Errors in perception can also be caused by our perceptual sets, or the frameworks that influence us to perceive certain things over others in a given situation. So in the car example, you have a perceptual set to identify anything that might affect your safety while driving since, you know, your goal is to make it to where you're going in one piece. In this case, a busted fender and law-breaking behavior catches your attention because you're more aware of things that might harm you while you're behind the wheel. Perception affects how we process communication in many different ways, including the explanations we come up with to understand the behaviors of ourselves and others. During communication, our brains run through a continuous series of why questions. The answers we come up with to explain the why behind behaviors we observe are called attributions. For instance, if you're a person who loves people watching, you probably get a a big kick out of playing with why questions, like when you see two people out at dinner together. You might ask yourself, why are they sharing one plate of spaghetti? Are they just not hungry? Are they trying to have a lady in the tramp moment? Even if you don't love people watching, you still make attributions throughout the day, whether you realize it or not. For instance, maybe you go to your early morning business class and notice your professor is late. Once you wonder why she's late, you'll probably start thinking of possible reasons in your head. You might assume that your professor stopped to grab coffee or got caught up chatting with a student after the previous class. You may start worrying that class was canceled and you missed the memo and valuable shut-eye, or that you somehow showed up on the wrong day. All of those answers to your why questions are attributions to explain your professor's behavior. Even though we have lots of experience making attributions, that doesn't mean we're always great at it. It's pretty unlikely that all of our explanations for a professor's tardiness are accurate. In fact, all of your attributions could be totally wrong. Your professor could have been in a fender bender and ran a red light to try to make it to class on time. That's right, we're bringing it all back. Our attempts to explain other people's behaviors are often inaccurate, and we try to make the same kinds of inaccurate attributions consistently over time and across different situations. These are what we call attribution errors, and there are two main types that shape how we perceive behavior, self-serving bias and fundamental attribution errors. The first type of attribution error is known as self-serving bias, which is the tendency to attribute our personal success to stable internal causes like our character or personality. On the other hand, we're more likely to attribute our personal failures to unstable external causes that are outside of our control, like weather, illness, or injury. The second type is known as the fundamental attribution error and has to do with how we perceive other people's successes and failures. We're more likely to think someone else's success is due to external factors, while their failure results from internal causes. Self-serving bias and fundamental attribution errors also shape the way we perceive negative situations, like failure. If it's a personal failure, self-serving bias says that we're likely to attribute it to factors we have no control over. If it was someone else's failure, fundamental attribution error says we'll probably chalk it up to internal factors, like a person's personality or character. Our failure isn't our fault. Someone else's failure is theirs. Attribution errors also play a role in how we interpret positive behavior. Like if I get a good grade on a test, I could attribute my success to internal factors, like how much I studied for the course material, which is an example of self-serving bias. But if my roommate gets a better grade on the same exam, I might attribute their success to external factors, like her finding the test's answer key. And that's a fundamental attribution error. Attribution errors shape how we explain the behaviors of ourselves and others, and they can even seem harmless when the stakes are low. But relying on attribution errors to explain more serious situations can do serious damage. Attribution errors can perpetuate harmful stereotypes and reinforce racial, gender, and other social inequities. So if we want to be responsible communicators, we have to be aware of attribution errors and try really hard to push back against them. One way to do that is by getting creative and brainstorming other explanations for people's actions. Like, maybe your roommate left the kitchen a mess not because they're an inconsiderate jerk, 
but because they had to rush her dog to the emergency vet. Using these brainstorming techniques to combat attribution errors can help us have more accurate perceptions, which in turn allows us to keep an open mind. To sum it all up, the perception process we continuously engage in is shaped by many factors, like who we are and our life experiences. And while perception is designed to help us take a bunch of evidence and come to a specific conclusion, that doesn't mean it's always accurate. That's why it's important to practice being more thoughtful in how we select, organize, and interpret the things we see in the world and how we explain that behavior. So the next time you're stuck in traffic, maybe give the driver with the busted bumper the benefit of the doubt. Thanks for watching Study Hall, Intro to Human Communication, which is part of the Study Hall project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.